Now we'll start with questions. Um, Karen DeWitt will ask the first question. Oh, who? Matt. I, I was going to ask the first question. Ooh, that's okay. Matt is. I don't mean to you throw you all off. Guys, you're throwing me off here. <laughs> all right. I can handle it. Matt Hamilton will ask the first question, and it will be answered first by Mr. Votolo. And um, when Matt has finished his question, you have two minutes to answer Mr. Votolo, okay. and then Mr. Tonko will have two minutes as well. <clears throat> Matt. Gentlemen, as was said at the outset, all politics is local, but there is uh, great interest among voters uh, in who candidates for Congress and even further down the ballot support at the top of the ticket, just given that there are strong opinions that have been developed uh, regarding those candidates. Uh, my question to you is, do you fully support your party's nominee for president? And if you do not, can you please specify in what areas you disagree with your party's nominee? Well, I do support my party's nominee, but I don't exactly see how that uh, folds into an economic policy question. Uh, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say that I do fully support my uh, party's nominee. Um, <coughs> And uh, I think that uh, he's the nominee that wants to break up the cartel of power in Washington, D.C. And that's why he's a threat to Republicans and to Democrats. He wants to destroy this whole idea, you know, Mr. Tonko had mentioned that he, that he wants to de get big money out of the government. Well, the problem is that the majority of his uh, finances comes from lobbyists and big money. Uh, he has, uh, uh, you know, he, he makes the point uh, to attract us to say that uh, um, uh, he wants to get big money out, but the real thing is, just like Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump is self-funded. Like myself, I'm pretty much self-funded. The majority of what I've spent on this campaign came out of my own pocket. And uh, because I believe in America, a lot of people said, what are you doing that for? I said, because I believe in America, and I believe that you and I can make a difference for the future for our children. And we need to stop the large power brokers in Washington, D.C. and bust up the cartel because they're in collusion with each other. Thank you. Mr. Tonko. Thank you. Um, when we uh, choose someone to lead us or respond to the, our needs, we reach to experience and professionalism and uh, uh, quality of service that has been a record. If we're choosing a surgeon, we go for the best. If we're choosing um, to have a plumber fix a sink, you want someone that has a sound reputation and the skill set. I believe that uh, because there's such uh, a need for us to tether this country through uh, an innovation economy, experience is important, as well as background and familiarity with the issues. I support my party's nominee. I believe that uh, Secretary Clinton has had an outstanding uh, portfolio, uh, serving us as First Lady, being there fighting for children in her early legal career, uh, serving as a United States Senator, representing our home state, and uh, then developing a Rolodex of world leaders as Secretary of State, a very helpful uh, bit of uh, additive that she can bring to the office. But I think more so is who can get things done. I think the track record of Hillary Clinton representing us as U.S. Senator in New York of New York in Washington was one of working across the aisle, across the houses, and with the executive branch, with Republican presidents as well. So I think that that spirit is something that we need right now. Who can get things done? My friends, there's a lot of unfinished business. It's mounting by the day. We have not addressed a lot of issues from Congress. We need to move forward, and someone that can bring us forward, move us forward with her intellect, with her passion to serve, she's had a tremendous career of service to this country and a familiarity with the issues. When I was energy chair of the New York State Assembly, she was doing her listening tour to garner support for the United States Senate nomination by our party and then eventually by the full force of uh, electorate. She asked questions in our one-on-one -on -one meetings about energy policy that no one heretofore had asked me. Profound questions, deep thinking, and a quick study. So I think that's important in this highly complex field of uh, issues that we need to address. Thank you. Um, the next question will be asked by Karen DeWitt. 
And just to clarify, um, we discussed uh, that there would be segments of, with particular subject matter. Um, and our esteemed pattern panel has uh, changed that up. So it's going to be one hour of uh, uh, collage okay. of, of right. uh, different questions. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, Karen uh, is going to ask her question, and Mr. Tonko will answer first. And we are going to get to the really nitty-gritty policy questions in just, in just a moment. But we wanted to get a couple of things out of the way. One is we don't really know how this presidential election is going to go. So the question for both of you, Mr. Tonko first. Um, Karen, are you could you speak in the microphone? Are you prepared yeah, to work? with the president or even a Congress of the opposite party? Because we don't know how this presidential election is going to go or any of this, so it could end up either way. And how would you work with if the other party's in power? How would you do that specifically? Sure. Um, I think that the acrimony that exists in politics today from the very top in Washington down to the local level is not serving the public well. Um, I've made it my goal throughout my career to work in bipartisan fashion. I've put uh, people on my bills from the Republican side. Republicans have put me on their bills. Uh, Dr. Bouchon from Indiana and I have carried a bipartisan bill that speaks to the opiate crisis. Uh, we have worked with um, Senator or Congressman Gibson on energy issues, uh, uh, tax credits that avail themselves to uh, an innovation economy and alternative energy technology. There's a list of bills that I've done that are bipartisan, but it's not just that bipartisan, putting your name on a bill. It's working together. And I've worked with uh, Representative Shimkus, who is the uh, chair of the Subcommittee on Environment and the Economy, and I, as ranker, we were able to push some major legislation that had been logjammed for many, many years. And I think it's because of that spirit of bipartisan uh, quality that uh, helped make it work. But I've served now in both a Democratic majority and Republican majority, and the track record of getting bills through uh, has been there. And uh, regardless of who this country chooses as its next president, it is important for the executive branch to work with the legislative and vice versa so that whomever this country decides is its leader, we work with that within this democracy. And uh, my goal has always been to reach out to the executive branch, let them know what we're working on, especially in particular assignment areas, science and tech for me, energy and commerce, subcommittee on environment and the economy, uh, seat co-chair with the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition, pushing and informing. I think dialogue is so important. I recently uh, was part of a panel discussion at Tang Museum on Skidmore campus with Representative Gibson. And the topic was building consensus and civility. And I got a lot of great feedback from that discussion. They liked what Chris had to say. They liked what I had to say. And it's all about dialogue. It's making certain we do that. I have reached out to every Republican on the energy, not every, I've been reaching out to Republicans on the Energy and Commerce Committee to sit down and do dinner, just one-on-one, -on -one, so we can get to know each other better and understand what the agenda is that we're promoting. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Tonko. And I would like to remind all of us that it seems you have to really have the microphone close to your mouth um, when you talk. So, Mr. Vitolo, could you answer that question, please? Okay, so um, my answer is basically this. I'd be able to work with anybody who was going to work within the framework of the Constitution. I'm very concerned that we have taken an incredible number of steps away from the Constitution. Uh, when it comes to bipartisan effort, uh, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, uh, if we are not working within that framework, then we're working outside of what the Founding Fathers intended or required for us in order to have a fully functioning government that uh, Take, that does not take away power from the states, which is what is taking place right now. The federal government is so far overreaching into the states, taking power away. The Tenth Amendment is strictly limiting to what the federal government is supposed to be doing, and yet they're well beyond the measures of which they're supposed to work. Now, if there are bills that uh, uh, I agree with with the Democrats, I'm going to vote with them. If there are bills that I think is in the best interest of the people in my uh, congressional district, I'm going to vote with them. Uh, whether Republican or Democrat. I can work with anyone so long as we are within the framework of what is right, not only for this country, not what only what is right for the constituents of this area, but what also is right in order to follow the Constitution. The reason why we're in so many 
uh, predicaments right now is because the federal government has stepped outside of their boundary. We have a bloated budget, an out of control, uh, I mean, uh, the stack of laws that are produced by the Congress is uh, as tall as I am in a year. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's too much legislation, too much regulation, and we need to unburden what is uh, uh, the businesses. We need to unburden uh, uh, individuals with towns and cities and schools. It's crazy, these unfunded mandates that are coming down the pike. And what does it hit? It hits the taxpayer. It doesn't, you know, they go, oh, well, we want the, the, the schools to do this because that's what's best for the school. Guess what? It costs the taxpayer. Thank you. The next question will be asked by Steve Muller, and the first answer, the person to answer first will be Mr. Vitolo. Steve. All right, this issue has already been touched on slightly by both uh, candidates already, but I wanted to you, return you, to it with a specific uh, mm -hmm. question. Uh, one of the most controversial Supreme Court cases of this century is Citizens United in which the court ruled that political donations essentially are protected free speech, giving cover for what critics say is dark money that influences elections. Do you believe that Citizens United is a case the Supreme Court should re-examine, and if it does not, should Congress look to address the situation through a constitutional amendment? I do believe it needs to be revisited. I uh, totally oppose uh, big money coming into uh, election campaigns, uh, big corporations uh, that have a interest because of legislation that uh, certain congressmen, Democrat and Republican alike, this is not a Democrat issue, this is not a Republican issue, this is an entitlement to those who are supposed to be public servants. They're getting large amounts of money from groups. We need to get rid of lobbyists, we need to get rid of uh, a lot, or at least lobbyist investments into people's campaigns. We need to get rid of large corporations donating huge amounts of money that tip the scales so that people make decisions in favor of those corporations or in favor of what they want. And we need to get rid of the influence that is corrupting, and it is corrupting our government. What happened to citizen leaders? What happened to people who went to Washington, did what they needed to do, and then come home? That's what the Founding Fathers intended. They never intended for this to be career. They never intended this uh, to be something that people would uh, decide, well, this is going to be, this is going, I'm going to get fat off of this. And people have gotten fat off of being politicians. So I really don't know uh, what uh, people's net worth is. Uh, they, sta they make statements of what it is, but I'm not even sure if those statements are true. Uh, I can tell you what my net worth is, uh, not much, all right? <laughs> uh, I lost just about everything uh, almost 20 years ago now when I fell 30 feet off a building and broke my back in two places. I sold everything I had, paid my bills, and went back to school, and now I'm a registered nurse. But uh, um, I don't have much of a net worth. And honestly, I'm not going to Washington to make a career. I'm, I'm 60 years old. Listen, I want to go home, and I want to play with my grandkids. I got 16 of them. I want to have some fun. But I want to go and preserve an America for them. Thank you. Mr. Tonko. Thank you, uh, Mary. The, um, the whole issue of campaign finance reform looms large uh, with the Democratic caucus within which I serve. Uh, they have made it a highest priority. And so I think that um, our push is to continue to work for this transparency and accountability in terms of campaign contributions. Um, I respect the judicial branch greatly, but on this one, I'll take exception to what they did by the narrowest of margins, five to four, the highest court in the land, the United States Supreme Court, decided that uh, there could be this benefit offered to uh, deep pockets, dark money, and uh, big money. And I think it's a ruination of our system. One of the most important standards that should follow this is transparency and uh, disclosure. When there's not those tools accompanied this decision, you have people contributing in ways that are outside of the usual realm uh, and uh, contributing buying seats, perhaps, in the House of Representatives, and it doesn't end there. Then their agenda becomes prime for those people for whom they bought the seat. I think it's important for us to move forward with legislation. I'm on a bill with Representative Van Hollen that would call for disclosure, uh, so that if these uh, 
uh, murky sources, if these unidentified or undefined sources are buying ads and influencing people in a disingenuous way, uh, then it is tagged on the bottom as to who the source is that's contributing to the price of that, f of that uh, commercial. I think it's important for us to at least have that identification, but it must, needs to go much further than that. The government of the many is what we ought to be not the government of the money. It's going to ruin our foundation as to many of the standard groups, the fundamental groups that contribute in large numbers, coming together with one voice as an organization. There's all sorts of accountability. They have to show everything they've raised and how they've spent it, and I have to show how I've spent those dollars that I might have accepted. I think that kind of accountability and transparency is fundamentally key to having an open democracy. But again, I'm on a bill that will Another bill that would, uh, by Mr. Sarbanes from Maryland, that would reduce, limit the amounts that you can give as an thank individual or party. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. Um, the next question will come from Matt and will be answered by Mr. Tonko first. There seems to be a consensus that our current uh, tax code, specifically the income tax code, is certainly complex and to at least some people unfair. I'm curious what uh, you would do in terms of changing our tax policy, and if you are to say, scrap it, what do you replace it with? And is there, uh, off of that, is there a place where Democrats and Republicans can find a middle ground in terms of, of tax reform? Thank you, Matt. Um, I would hope there's middle ground. The great many of us are the middle income community of this country. And then a number, great number, who are looking to uh, um, ascend uh, the middle income crowd. That should be fundamental. We have drained the taxpayer at the middle income level. They have become the price tag, the, the, the revenue source for a, a lot of the needs that we have. Investment in infrastructure, which we can't avoid. Investment in research, which grows jobs. And the list goes on and on. This is how we have a stronger, more hopeful tomorrow by investments. But for a number of years, we have talked about coming to the, uh, to the table. Coming to the table to do tax policy reform was mentioned in 2010, 2012, 2014, and I'm certain people are talking about it now. We need to come to that table, review which tax uh, uh, issues, incentives, or um, uh, benefits are offered and what they produce. And from there, be very academic about it. Again, the middle income community has been drained by this activity. We have fundamental needs from healthcare to education to infrastructure to research that need to be met. And we're only fooling ourselves if we don't have everyone pulling their fair share in this process. And uh, when we look at, again, the dark money, where 1% of the top 1% is contributing hundreds, millions, half a billion to these campaigns this year, that has to stop because we need to have fairness equitable treatment, um, and it happens by coming together in a bipartisan strategy and in an academic way, open discussion, dialogue on tax policy reform. Thank you. Mr. Vitolo. Well, it does desperately need to be reform, and the fact that the middle class is getting slammed with taxes has a lot to do with legislation that uh, even Mr. Tonko has signed and gotten behind. We are uh, in a place in America where the middle class is paying a considerably large sum, although I think the answer really lies around full equity, and that is a flat tax. I'm in favor of a flat tax. It will do three things. One, it will make it even across the board. Whether you make $1,000 or $100 billion, you pay your 15%, and you're done. No exemptions, no restrictions. You're, you pay your 15%. That's it. Uh, you would be able to do three things. One, you'd be able to uh, make it fair for everyone. Two, you'd be able to reduce the size of the IRS, which is an extremely bloated uh, body within the federal government. We need to begin to re uh, uh, downsize the federal government. Uh, I got a plan from a guy who is a, uh, a professor of economics and uh, uh, he, he told me that we can actually reduce the size of the federal government by 
a, a year, over the next 15 years, cut the federal government in half without firing one person, simply by attrition. I think it's time that the federal government starts to run the way we run our household. I mean, I don't understand it. There's nobody printing money out there for me. And uh, I know there's nobody out there printing money for you. I want to know how is it that all this money got printed, bailed out banks, bailed out large corporations, and yet those very same banks turned around, and what did they do? They foreclosed on people, kicked them out of their house, threw them out on the street. Really? What we need to do is we need to make things fair and equitable across the board. Thank you. The next question is from Karen and will be answered by Mr. Vitolo. And it's on college affordability. The amount of student debt in this country stands at over a trillion dollars, with the class of 2016 students owing an average of $37,000 each. What can be done to make college more affordable for families? Well, I think the first thing that can be done, and I think that's a great question, uh, the first thing that can be done is we need to have better oversight over the colleges. I find it ridiculous that colleges get huge amounts of money from the state and the federal government, and it goes into buildings and it goes into facilities that are uh, uh, decorations. Listen, uh, you know my kids, they were homeschooled, and uh, we had, they sat at the kitchen table. And uh, let me tell you what it produced. A um, person, uh, my daughter is an assistant administrator at Albany Medical Center. My son is a naval officer who oversees Operation Iron Dome. He got, he's a liaison between uh, the Joint Chief of Staff and the Secretary, a uh, Minister of Defense of Israel. I have a son who's a lawyer, barred in Virginia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Just rewrote the trust laws of South Carolina and the governor signed them into law. Uh, you know, and I have a daughter who's working on her accounting degree. My other daughter is a, has an English degree. She's currently teaching at uh, Columbia Green. And I have a son who's a chef. You know, we didn't have anything fantastic. But, you know, education doesn't have anything to do with facilities, although facilities help. We need to, if we're going to fix the college debt problem, we need to get the college education problem under control. Uh, professors need to teach their classes instead of writing books and letting their adjuncts teach a class, and they're sitting in their office writing books, and then have the students buy those books for 500 bucks a volume. I'm sorry, that is immoral. Immoral. So you want to get the debt under control? Get the education system under control. And we need to do something to help these kids. I think I have a plan. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. Thank you. Karen, this is a question that's asked often in the uh, 20th Congressional District. And um, first, we need to acknowledge, is college for everyone? And it may not be. But when a campaigner uh, of recent past suggested that our students should adjust their dreams to affordability at a college campus, I think is the wrong approach. We need to encourage the talent we have there. We need from skilled set labor over to PhDs to really function as an economy. And so wherever the talent rests, and that might be in some of the poorest circles of life in our country. Wherever that talent is, it should not be denied a higher education potential simply because of uh, unaffordability. The college debt situation is something now that has surpassed many other loans out there. Student loans are surpassing car loans and, and the like. If people have the opportunity and the right to refinance some of their loans out there, why not give that opportunity to students? So the first thing we need to do is offer refinancing opportunities to anyone out there. As the market would bear benefit, they should have connection to that benefit. I think also some of the efforts made to take the middleman out of the equation so that there's more affordability for those students is important. And it speaks again to a fundamental need to focus heavily on higher ed. I agree, we need to make certain those costs are as contained as possible, and it also calls for items like Pell Grants to maintain their sense of strength. You know, when you talk about cutting into the domestic side of the budget, the federal budget, I have to just share here, I voted against the Budget Control Act of 2011 simply basically because of a concept called sequestration. And when you look at the federal budget on the domestic side, 
We're not living off of fat. We have reduced to the point where oftentimes through Social uh, Security, through the VA, through several programmings that we see all the time with the constituent need that calls into our district, a lot of it is held back or denied because of sequestration. So we need to see the growth of this budget for what it is. We pay trillions for war. Our domestic Thank side is Thank painfully cut. Thank you. Um, the next question will come from Steve, and it will be answered first by Mr. Tonko. One of the signature accomplishments of the Obama administration was the passage of the Affordable Care Act. How would you regard the success of the ACA so far? If you think it is working satisfactorily, what changes would you support to improve it? If you don't think ACA is working, what policies and measures would you propose to provide improved access to health insurance for Americans who don't get health insurance coverage through their employers? Thank you, Steve. Um, again, a very popular item out there and one that uh, has received a lot of attention on the House floor. I've been asked to repeal the Affordable Care Act, I think some 60 times or so. Um, what we need to recognize is that in the beginning, in 2009 when the discussion began and all of the networking was done with the, uh, uh, with the town halls that each legislator across this country was holding, they built the very best package. Now we're trying to reform a process that has many, many players and many, many dollars involved. And so we have to look at where we were in 2008 and 9. And it was forecasted that it would be totally unaffordable, that many, many were not on the rolls. We have put about a million, just shy of a million New Yorkers onto uh, an affordable care plan. Um, I think that insurance is critical. It speaks to quality of life and dignity of life. Um, like any monumental legislation, which this is, like Social Security, like Medicare, there has been this fine tuning, this tweaking, if you will, of the experience that comes with that legislation. No one can imagine all the potential dynamics. And if there is a way to improve, I say let's improve, and I think there are ways we can improve. But I've been there speaking to the issues of, you know, no lifetime caps on policies. If we repeal this, that's lost. Talking about uh, the prejudice that's uh, placed against women that may be pregnant, or preconceived uh, uh, conditions out there, or, or uh, preconditions that exist, where acne was refusing, a uh, force to refuse health care for children. You know, you can't have it that way. There are many good things that happened with this. There is the closing of the uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, issue by 2020 that will benefit our senior citizen community. A lot of great strength that came with it. Again, a lot of people added onto the system. Um, we need to make certain that we take the uh, navigators of the system who encourage people and help them roll, enroll and now use them to help them buy smart here because Thank deductibles you. and all that are dynamics that have to be addressed. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. Mr. Vitolo. Well, first of all, uh, Mr. Tonko voted for the Affordable Health Care Act, even though 68 percent of the people in his district opposed it. Uh, they came and they brought questions to him, and uh, he basically downplayed them. Uh, and, you know, he said there were things that were unforeseen. Well, they were unforeseen because the thing was placed on the table and they had a very short period of time to vote for it. Nobody had a time to take a look at it. As a matter of fact, if I remember the signature quote, you'll know what's in it after you pass it. Well, guess what? That was a foolish vote. Because you know what was in it? They promised that it would only cost $900 billion. Does anybody know what the price tag is right now? 2.6 trillion. 2.6 trillion, according to the federal numbers. And also, according to the federal numbers, Arizona's uh, health care co costs gonna go up 68%. Illinois, an average of 43%. Iowa, an average of 31%. Pennsylvania, an average of 23%. This year, North Carolina, an average of 20%. New York, somewhere between 5 and 18%. They're not sure. Everybody's health care is going up. We were supposed to pay less. We're paying more. We were supposed to pay $2,500 or $3,500 a year less. The average person is paying $4,500 a year less. And by the way, Mr. Tonko voted for that health care plan, but that's not the one he chose. He chose the federal health care plan, which cost about $1,400 a month. But you and I subsidize that for $1,000 a month. He pays 400 of it. And who's subsidizing my health care plan? That's what I want to know. Why is it that the taxpayers are always subsidizing Washington? 
when he uses the code talk invest, that means take that tax dollars out of your pocket and give it to the federal government, the fat bureaucrats, or some agency that is sucking money away, including these big giant green companies that all went under after sucking away the bailout money. Thank you, Mr. Votolo. Now uh, the next question is from Matt, and Mr. Votolo will answer first. On trade, uh, there's been much discussion about, A, the effectiveness of, of NAFTA, but looking forward about a, a trans-Pacific partnership and whether that's a correct place to move and uh, you know how, how we should move forward with that. First of all, do you support a TPP and, and you know based on what we know about how that is progressed in negotiations, the way that that is progressing, do you support that? And also, if you do not support uh, the TPP, I mean, what, what direction do you think this country should move on or in in terms of trade? Well, it's uh, one of the areas where I agree, agree with Mr. Tonko, and that is I am 100% opposed to the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, uh, although we disagree on different levels. Uh, my conditioning on th the problem with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it's too burdensome on American companies. American companies, American trade, we pay a larger portion than the other countries in the involvement of the of the uh, agreement. So I uh, oppose uh, a lot of these trade agreements, including NAFTA. Uh, they have not benefited America. They have injured America. And I think we need to, once again, go back to a standard tariff system like we had uh, at the uh, founding of this country and uh, stay away from this massive amount of federal involvement when it comes to uh, international trade. Uh, for instance, uh, we seem to get involved in, uh, like recently the federal government themselves purchased a big giant chunk of cheese from a foreign country because they wanted to help that country out. It was a really nice thing for them to do. You know what the problem was? And this is the problem with all these crazy little trade things that they do. Farmers right here in the state of New York have to dump hundreds of pounds of milk on the ground because the places where they used to sell their m surplus milk to won't buy it to make cheese because there's a requirement that you have to buy federal surplus first. And so we are cutting the throats of the American farmers, the Ameri American manufacturers, American industry by entering into these agreements that are so overburdensome on us and entering into the government trying to offset things for other governments. The government needs to stay out of that kind of business. Thank you, Mr. Vitola. Mr. Tonko. Sure, thank you, Mary. The um, effort here, Steve, I think is to look at the big picture and uh, see where we've been with our trade agreements. And if they're anti-labor, if they're anti-environment, and a number of other standards that we pride ourselves on having as a nation, then we can't be placed on that unlevel playing field. And with the TPP, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we're talking about an agreement with 12 nations that comprise 40% of the world's GDP. That's a huge impact. This one can't be done incorrectly. And I think the fact that, um, you know, if we, if we provide a situation where there's a benefit to workers in Vietnam making 50 some to 60, 50 to 60 cents an hour, we're going to dumb down the workforce around the, country, around the world. So it's more than just an impact on us as a nation. And so I stand for trade, but trade that works for all of us in this nation and where we have effective opportunity to be competitive. Um, it can't be an unlevel playing field. The, um, the standards, I think, need to uh, be addressed in very open context. But what I really worry about is that oftentimes the implementation of these agreements is not there. Even if you can get some um, stable or sound agreement, which TPP is not, it still lies in the hands of implementing. And there's courts. The ISDS court allows for corporate people. For instance, if you didn't want some label on a cigarette package, you as a corporation can go to this court established by the agreement that enables them to have a heavy um, emphasis 
on maybe undoing some regulations in this country that we've imposed. Now, that's a, an awesome benefit offered the corporate sector. So I think we need to be real about this. There is a great, we can't be isolationists, obviously. We need to trade. We're 4.7% of the world population, but we're a huge economy that everyone around the world would like to trade with. So we should use that strength for opportunities for trade that is different than these agreements that lock us in Thank long term. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. Situations. The next question will be asked by Karen and will be answered first by Mr. Tonko. Gun control, where do you stand? Should the gun show loophole be closed? Should people on the terrorist no-fly list be banned from buying weapons? You know, thank you, Karen. The, um, the real concern today to national and international security is terrorism that uh, can loom large. We need to make certain that those who are on a no-fly list cannot buy. To me, it makes sense. Since 2004, 2,500 people have been able to legally purchase a weapon, uh, and they've been on that no-fly list. That is very telling to me. So we need to close that loophole. There is certainly background checks required for ordinary gun purchases. But if you do it online or if you do it at a gun show, that requirement isn't uh, there. So I think that it has to be uh, a background check situation, making certain that no one has a gun that ought not have that gun uh, because of the uh, concern for safety or terrorism associated with that purchase. I think that certainly, you know, those in a territory like ours where they practice, target practice, or hunt, obviously, you know, I'm not looking to take your gun. I just don't want, I want some of those standards to be great. And I've talked to neighbors, relatives, friends who are gun owners who target practice or hunt, and they say, background checks, bring them on. I'm a responsible citizen, what should I worry about? And it's when the forces, the undue influence of the NRA on legislators, you know, we had to do a sit-in this year to bring attention to the issue, and finally people got it. They said, look it, here's what's holding it up. It's not like we're all like NRA friendly in the House, that there were those who wanted progressive policy, and there were those that were the resistance to that policy. And the sit-in, with thanks to the periscopes that we had with modern technology, after the light, after the the cameras were shut off in the House, we still were able to broadcast to this country. And okay. people, I never received such a response like I did with the sit-in, so that Th people better had a better definition to the issue and who was where on the issue. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. Mr. Vitolo. We have a lot of gun laws in this country. And if we enforce those gun laws, then everything will be okay. The problem is we don't enforce the gun laws we have. So if we enforce those gun laws, there wouldn't be a problem. We don't need, again, more legislation. And honestly, the sit-in was an embarrassment uh, for uh, American government. But uh, the, um, the uh, whole idea of gun control is uh, very, very uh, divisive. And, uh, you know, there are countries uh, where they have no guns, and then there's countries where every single household has a gun. And uh, so, you know, we can say, oh, well, those countries that have no guns are better off. Well, that's not true because some of these countries that every household has a gun, they're, they're, uh, they're doing all right too. So uh, we can take a look at uh, a lot of different things, but the bottom line is the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment guarantees our right to bear arms. And I am not in favor of legislation like uh, Mrs. Clinton is in favor of that we register our hunting rifles. Sorry, I don't think that the federal government needs to know where every uh, uh, rifle is. It's none of their business. I am not a terrorist. I am not an anarchist. I am not a rebel. But what I am is a citizen of the United States, and until we decide to overturn the Constitution and overturn the Bill of Rights, uh, then I'm going to hold on to my guns, and even then, I'm still going to hold on to my guns. Thank you. 
The next question is from Steve and will be answered by Mr. Votolo. Many Americans believe that there is an illegal immigration crisis in our country, yet Congress has been unable to agree on comprehensive immigration reform legislation. What would you like to see in an immigration reform package, and specifically, how would you deal with the large numbers of illegal immigrants residing in the U.S.? That's a good question. Uh, there is a terrible immigration problem in this country, and uh, uh, we need to fix it. It needs to be addressed, but I don't believe that amnesty is the answer. We've tried that three times already, and all it did was bring a larger flood of illegal immigrants in. We need to tighten up our borders. Uh, we need to uh, strengthen our security border guards, uh, north and south. Uh, I personally tried this myself. There are three areas in the state of New York where you can walk across into Canada and uh, no one's even going to say anything to you. And uh, so what's that going to do to stop a terrorist from walking the opposite direction? We need to do something about our borders. We need to secure our borders because I don't believe that America is safe from terrorism and that Congress is not doing their job. The immigration issue, we have a, an incredible number of illegal immigrants. Honestly, some people will take issue with this. They need to go back and come back the right way. Um, I don't believe that these illegal immigrants uh, should be able to stay here. I have people who live on my block who came in the right way only about nine years ago. And they are so offended by even the thought of giving it away. These people worked hard to become citizens of the United States. They're proud to be citizens of the United States. And those who come in and disgrace the United States, especially criminal offenders, they should be put out and never be allowed to come back again. But instead, they've been brought back, some of them two and three times, have killed people in California, have killed people in Texas, have killed and raped people in Florida. Listen. We need to get our borders under control. We need to do something with this immigration problem. There does need to be comprehensive reform, but the reform does not involve amnesty. Thank you. Mr. Tanko. Yes, thank you. Before I answer that immigration thing, I just want to make a point that I'm surprised that where there are loopholes that enable people who have proven themselves unworthy of, a holding, of owning a gun would be not a concern to my opponent. I think that we uh, need to see mm -hmm. that for what it is. Uh, with the immigration issue, we're a nation of immigrants. I'm a grandson of immigrants, proud of that label. Work with immigrants who uh, just the other day went to a celebration of a gentleman 73 years old who came here at the age of 23, 21, excuse me, by the age of 23, started a business, and it's been very successful. He's hiring hundreds of people. That's the American dream. We don't deny that simply by a carte blanche rejection of uh, immigrants that should have a sound pathway to citizenship. This is what I think is essential. Now, the United States Senate, in a bipartisan fashion, put together a bill that was deemed balanced and constitutional. And we have failed to address that bill. The House has refused to take action on legislation that would offer people the soundness of a, uh, of a pathway to citizenship. Talk to the medical community. Talk, I, and I do all the time to the engineering community, to the farming community. They would be hurt by some of these extreme measures because they require immigrant populations to address their personnel needs. So I think that that has to be borne in mind. And you know, when I think of us as New York and the harbor of New York and the Statue of Liberty and the torch held high and the statement that we are that home to those who have struggled, may be escaping tyranny, may be refugees, who are, by the way, vetted by a very defined, deliberate, and tough process. And we have a role to play there. Because if these people are left in a zone where they're tortured and maltreated, it's a perfect storm for terrorists, for ISIS, to come to them and recruit them for their numbers. Thank you. We have to see the big picture here. Thank you. The next question is from Matt and will be answered by Mr. Tonko. The 
20th district has the capital region's largest municipalities within its borders um, and an issue that is predominantly uh, played out within inside of our urban areas is the strained relations between minority communities and uh, law enforcement. I'm curious, is this an area where you see that a member of Congress can legislatively address this issue somehow, or is this more of an issue that as a member of Congress through some sort of advocacy you can begin to help improve those relations? Yes, it's a concern, Matt, around the nation, and we've seen some issues that have played out in some very particular painfully uh, and painful expression. The, um, the importance it begins again with dialogue. I pride myself on having a good re working relationship with every neighborhood of this congressional district, including those that are predominantly black or Latino or Asian as newly entering into our community. And the dialogue that's established enables me to better understand from all perspectives about the hurt and the injustice. And you know, I think all the players are willing to do this. I talk to our police forces who are a tremendous strength in this district. They obviously are in this mission to provide for safer communities. And certainly everyone deserves the right to a safer community. What you glean from those conversations, what you get from the dialogue that is open and steady and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and very informing, is the tool that you use for um, resource advocacy and public policy. And I think in general, just in general, we need stronger urban policy in this country. The millennials are telling us they're going to migrate to cities. They want that. They want sustainable communities, walkable communities where they live, work, and play in an urban culture. Well, government should be ahead of that curve. And government needs to look at the public safety elements, they need to look at the various elements that builds a better urban core. And by the way, it's smart growth to reinvest in our cities. So amongst that, obviously, is public safety and making certain that we're guided by the, um, the voices of the police community and the community uh, uh, neighborhood uh, voice. Thank you. Mr. Vitolo. Well, first, I just want to go back and address the vetting policy. Uh, of uh, refugees coming in. According to our CIA, our FBI, that it is, they say it is impossible to fully vet these people. So, and uh, the other th issue when it comes to those refugees as immigrants coming into this country, and believe me, my grandparents, they came over as immigrants and they were proud to be Americans. Uh, there are people who are coming over uh, and you yourself have been responsible in bringing 3,000 Syrian refugees, I believe it is, into the area. And uh, we don't know, they haven't been able to be vetted properly. And the, we, the population here, is paying for their health care, their housing, their uh, living. Um, we are schooling them. We are putting undue burdens on our schools. So as far as it being a great thing, it's not really that great of a thing. To get to the issue that you asked me about, I believe that our police community is probably amongst the best. This is a great area. We don't have a lot of the problems they're having in a lot of other areas, and that's because there is a discussion. There are some tough places. There are some bad actors all the way around. It doesn't matter. I have a great friend, Darnell, who says that you know, he, he says, you know, you know what I teach my kids? He said, I teach my kids, when the policeman tells you to step out of the car, you step out of the car. You don't take your phone, put it on Facebook or Facebook Live, and stick it in the cop's face. And that's the kind of message that needs to be sent all the way around, whether it's, whether it's uh, uh, um, you know, black, Latino, or white, for that matter. Listen, I was not a good kid when I was young. I got the peanuts kicked out of me by a cop. And I deserved it, really. Uh, not that he should have, but it happens. Thank you. Karen, and Mr. Votello will answer. OK, this is a foreign policy question. Since the beginning of the 21st century, the US has intervened militarily in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria. 
What would your criteria be in assessing when a situation in another country justifies a U.S. military intervention? That's a great question. Uh, it's a great constitutional question. Uh, war is to be declared by Congress. Uh, and uh, when we enter into a situation, whether it's Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, whatever, it needs to be declared by Congress, not uh, uh, some emotion. Do I agree? Did I agree that we should have gone into Iraq? No. I disagree. Uh, I disagree with going into Afghanistan. I disagree with going into a lot of these countries. Do I think we need to go after terrorists who have uh, brought burdens on America? Absolutely. But uh, the criteria for going in is when the American population, the nation of America, is under threat, when it is imperative for the safety of Americans, unless we agree as a Congress to help another nation, uh, and the Congress then joins in that decision. I don't believe in a carte blanche given to uh, a president. Oh, That's right. Excuse me. Yep. Excuse me. So. You. I agree. Thank you. No. Oh, please. So uh, with, uh, with that, uh, I believe, once again, that that power does rely with the Congress and, uh, um, and constitutionally. See, again, that's what I said. I will get behind anyone. I will get involved with Republicans, Democrats, independents, uh, libertarians, if they are solidly moving along the lines of constitutionalism, I'm with them. Thank you. Mr. Tonko. Certainly. Well, the um, question, Karen, was, was uh, stated in a very broad context, and that's very important for this discussion. Because since the turn of the century, uh, we've had a long bit of commitment to these wars, and the longest in our history with uh, Afghanistan. And I think it's important for us to understand that the taxpayers are exhausted, and critically so, our military is exhausted. So we need to do it smart along with deliberate. When you ask about the conditions, I need, I believe we need to make certain we have our allies with us. We can't go it alone. We can't be the cop for the world. So that's a fundamental principle that needs to be involved. But before that, resorting to diplomacy, coming to the table, and making certain that we can talk out the issues before we have boots on the ground. And I would resist boots on the ground unless there were some very severe situation. Um, and also, you know, I think the, uh, the AUMF out there, uh, authorization to use military force, is very broad. Uh, presidencies ago, we, um, we, uh, we put stuff together that enabled the executive branch to have carte blanche uh, go uh, green light to invest in a way that was uh, uh, demanding much of our nation and our troops. So I believe that um, you know, we need to make certain that uh, we have a good balanced approach with our allies, and that's creating allies in the Mideast, making certain that the Kurdi forces and, and other governments are where they are US friendly are part of our allied force. And again, I would go back to the refugee issue. We cannot afford to allow refugees to be that perfect storm where they are the recruitment bonanza for ISIS. We need to see that issue for what it is from all perspectives. People demoralized, people dehumanized by not so kind dictators, um, not so benign dictators, are then a perfect recruitment uh, crew for Mister, ISIS. Thank you. Um, our last question from the panel would be from Steve. And it will be answered first by Mr. Tonko. Uh, several of the recent answers and questions uh, from both candidates have touched on the issues of immigration and refugees. So I would just like to ask on a follow-on question. I think realistically, 
we have to admit that the population and economic activity in much of upstate New York is stagnant or declining, but could resettling refugees in these communities provide an economic boost? Well, you know, the importance, I talked about uh, engineers, about uh, in the immigrant population, about medical types. We are one of the hottest hubs in the country, one of the top five in this country for innovation, green collar, high tech job growth. Uh, if you're to go to global found, uh, foundries and walk through the cafeteria space, which is immense, you'll see menus from around the world. That's how diverse that workforce is there. When we create situations where we have not been able to fill, according to 2011 statistics, 600,000 manufacturing jobs because of lack of skill sets, when that number is projected to grow to 2 million by 2025, we have to have a mix. We have to make certain we're reaching to STEM and encouraging our people to develop this, the, the, uh, the skill sets and the intellect so that they can uh, fill these jobs. But many of the uh, sectors of our economy require that opportunity to have our immigrant population assume some of these jobs. That is our order of competitiveness and then to grow their American dream here as our families before us did. So I think that um, we have to be real and focused on how we develop all this activity. And by the way, with us being one of the five hottest hubs of real estate in the country for that job growth, we are deemed by many of the sources that do these uh, uh, counts to be one of the two most exponentially rising. So it's a growth area for this district. It's an empowerment, an economic multiplier, and it's a way for us, again, to celebrate diversity in a way that makes us a uh, unique, welcoming neighborhood as a 20th congressional district. Thank you. Mr. Vitolo. Well, <clears throat> I'll say this uh, to start off with. Uh, the people that are coming over from Syria are not engineers, are not architects, uh, are not doctors and lawyers that are coming over as refugees. And I'll have to agree with the Bernie plan. And the Bernie plan was to establish refugee camps in the friendly Islamic countries so that when those people's civil war was over, they would go back to their own country. Which, by the way, Sanders said it would cost one 250th of what it's costing us to bring each Syrian refugee over here and maintain them until the war is over. So uh, we do have a declining uh, economy here. Uh, although there is uh, some businesses that are skyrocketing, there's thousands of businesses that are go on going under. As a matter of fact, we're losing 1,100 companies, uh, uh, businesses in the state of New York every year. Uh, they're leaving, they're fleeing. Why? Because it costs too much to do business in here. We need to do something about the problems that we're having in the state of New York. And uh, bringing refugees in is not the best plan because it's only putting a larger tax burden on the people who live here. Secondly, when it comes to the diversity of those in these big companies up there, global foundries and whatever, they're getting corporate welfare. They're getting subsidized to bring in people with H-1V and L-1V visas. And uh, we have people from RPI, SUNY Poly, Union College, who can't get jobs. There was just a big article in the paper about it. They can't get jobs in the state of New York. And you're telling me that they're not qualified, but people from another country is? I'm sorry, I disagree, Mr. Tonko. I think that we, if we're gonna subsidize those companies, then why don't we subsidize them to hire those folks instead of people outside the country? Those people who have giant, giant student loans, and uh, they, they, they're struggling in deciding what in the world they're going to do with their life. Thank you. 